can stand in my way! Enemies of the Imperium, hear me. You have come here to die. The Immortal Emperor is with us and we are invincible. We must hold the enemy back! Strike quickly! Strike now! This is Imperial territory now. Fortify position. Show me what passes for fury among your misbegotten kind! After Relic abandoned the Dawn of War franchise, the games were kept alive by mods, and there are many of these to spice up your game to keep you coming back and playing. For Dawn of War Soulstorm, you had the Apocalypse mod, the Tyranid mod, the Firestorm mod, and many more included. For Dawn of War 2, you had the Elite mod for multiplayer, and the Last Stand Forgotten Emerald mod as well. For Dawn of War 3, you had... Fuck. Um... I guess the Death Watch mod? But it got discontinued? rip? Sorry? But the modders were not done, and they wanted to embark on possibly the biggest mod ever done for Dawn of War Soulstorm. So what is the Unification mod? Essentially, it takes many of the Dawn of War mods and combines them into one package. Hence the name, Unification. This mod has over 10 years of work gone into it. Just think about that, it's more than most games get, and there are many people to acknowledge and honour for doing this. From lore experts, to voice actors, to balance testers, there are many people who have contributed to making this mod. But the main people to thank for this are Team Thudmizer. This is a group made up of talented 3D artists, coders, sound engineers and many other skills who have been the main driving force behind this mod. These guys are doing the Emperor's work. The fact they've been working on this in their free time just shows they have a true passion for modding and they should be really proud for making it and I hope people see that. This now leaves me the hard task of making a video that's worthy of their mod and I promised that I would do them justice. Whilst the Ultimate Apocalypse mod actually felt like a mod, in my opinion, the Unification mod actually feels more like an expansion from Relic themselves or a remaster. Let me take you through the list. At least this time, it's a good list. We've got campaign updates, new models for vanilla races, new units for vanilla races, new voices and sound effects, titans, new AI, survival mode, last stand mode, kill team mode, easter eggs, 17 races slash factions, bug fixes, and also consistent support and updates. I think Miguel would be jealous of a list like this. If you don't get the joke, go watch the Eternal Crusade video. But there's a lot to cover here, and I'm going to be going into each one in detail. 16 times the detail. The first thing I have to talk about is the remodels of all the vanilla races. Space Marines, Orcs, Eldar, Chaos, Tau, Necron, Sisters of Battle, Dark Eldar and Imperial Guard have all had every single model remastered. Well, at least most of them have. For example, here's a vanilla Space Marine. And now here's a Unification mod Space Marine. Here's a Vanilla Predator, and here's a Unification mod Predator, or one of the many ones you can choose from. Team Thubmizer have gone beyond just remodeling these assets, they've given them more effects and personality. Just to give a few examples, take the Baneblade here. They could have remodeled it the exact same way, but instead they stuck a little sergeant on the top of an auto gun. How cute is that? The Chaos Predator was remodelled with a lot more spikes on it, and also a little dead corpse on the front. And just as a last example, some Defilers may have a different head, and also may be bearing a standard. One of the other things Team Thubmizer have done, is try to make each model an individual. For example, the Vanilla Space Marines were all the same model, they had nothing different about them. But in the Unification mod, some may have different helmets or chest plates and different purity seals on different sides of their armour and it really helps sort of sell that these are different characters. And it's not just the Space Marines, each race with its own individual units have like different versions of themselves. It's so refreshing to see all these old assets redone and I will dive into it a little bit more when we talk about the races and factions individually. One 
one of the other things Team Thubmizer have done is add loads of new units to the vanilla races. This aims to make these races more fleshed out, but also give you more choice when playing. Some races did get more love than others, for example the Necrons had a lot of their roster redone, whilst the Space Marines only got one or two new units. Once again, Team Thubmizer did not stop there. A lot of these new units have their own upgrades, allowing them to be customised how you want to play them. They also have their own effects and abilities, truly making them feel part of the game. Just look at how well this weird boy has been animated. I mean, I wouldn't bat an eyelid if you told me this was part of the original Dawn of War. However, if you're looking for a lore-friendly mod, then you might be disappointed. But if you're looking for a mod that's done the lore justice, then you've come to the right place. What I mean by this is you're going to see units from the Horus Heresy all the way up to the Indomitus Crusade. For example, you'll see units like the Whirlwind Scorpius all the way up to Primaris Marines. There's also Primarchs, Alive and Dead. Let me, uh, let me just fix that real quick. Much better. One of the other things I love is that all these new units fit into the game's art style perfectly. It truly feels like Dawn of War has been remastered. Once again, we'll dive into this a little bit more deeply when we cover the races and factions. Whilst the music of Unification mod is copyrighted, I can talk about the sound effects and voice oh, acting. With all of the new units for new races and factions and also the vanilla races, they need a lot of new sound effects and voice acting, so it seems over the years they've pulled a lot of people in to do this. And I won't lie, in my opinion, I feel they've nailed a lot of the voices and it seems really professional. Just listen to the Necrons. word i just checked out matthew's channel some of the voices on here are amazing seriously go check out his true bio and other videos it's not just the necrons as well any new unit has had this exact same passion of voice acting put into it and one that i have to give props for is the wraith knight for those of you that don't know wraith knights are piloted by eldar twins where one has died and the other sacrifices themselves so they can both operate a wraith knight together they actually got two people to voice act for the wraith knight if that isn't commitment to making this mod good, then I don't know what is. Spawning in the game, using abilities, getting upgrades, attacking, moving, stopping, all has their own voice lines. I'm just going to show you a few of my favourite voice lines I've found in the mod so far, and some are just brilliant. Here we go, here we go, here we go! Don't presume you can order me around. Beat me, I deserve it! Mmm, we like strong lords. <laughs> what the fuck is this? You're going to get power fisted tonight. Burn the heretic! The alien, the traitor. And by far, my personal favourite is the homosexual driving the rhino. The engine of pleasure has arrived. My lord, your will. The engine of pleasure has arrived. Finally, the engine of pleasure has arrived. I like the equality. 
but the voice acting is great and there are so many more units I wish I could show off, but we would be here forever showing off everyone's voice acting in this mod. Moving on from voice acting though, we have sound effects and they've had the exact same justice done in this mod. From simple things like clicking on buildings all the way up to giant battles, you're going to hear a lot of new sound effects. Here's a few of my favourite. Now I'm not saying everything is perfect, some voice lines don't fit and some sound effects are reused from other places, but I don't think it's worth complaining about. Time to talk about Titans. I love Titans, and Team Thubmizer have given one to all the vanilla races. Now before you say, Apocalypse has more so it's better, Team Thubmizer have always clarified that the Unification mod is not meant to be an Apocalypse mod. Of course the Apocalypse mod has more endgame units and abilities, but that is harder to balance. The Unification mod is focusing on more being an actual expansion for Soulstorm with more choices on races, game modes, and most importantly, balancing. One way they do this is by having certain caps on units. For example, things like Titans and Primarchs, you're only going to be allowed one of them in the match. And I won't lie, some of the Titans are pretty damn big and powerful, so if you still want that Apocalypse flair, you're still going to get that in this mod. If you must have your Apocalypse sized battles in the Unification mod, Team Thubmizer have catered to you as well. There's a simple add-on to the mod allowing you to have as many titans as you want, but Team Thubmizer have once again claimed that they are trying to balance for Vanilla Dawn of War. And when it comes to balancing, they are consistently taking feedback and requests, so don't feel like if you play the game and something is too OP that it won't be changed in the future. The way the Unification mod is handling its endgame unit is that each Vanilla race will have one titan and one titan killer. The reason they are doing this is because a lot of the new races have big titans and they want to give a fighting chance to the vanilla races. Right now their plan is to add titans in stages, tier 1 level being the Warhound Titan and then they will take feedback from the community and decide whether adding more titans is necessary. But it seems they want things to be coded and modelled properly when added and not just placeholders. Now I know this question will come up in the comments section. No, the Unification mod is not compatible with the Apocalypse mod, so don't ask. Anyway, moving on to the campaign. Welcome to the single player campaign of Dawn of War Soulstorm. These <laughs> One of the biggest changes that comes with the Unification mod is to the campaign. With the remastered models, new units and abilities, you also have the campaign configurator. This allows you to use skirmish settings in the campaign and also any settings added by the Unification mod. None of these settings has descriptions, so I will provide a link in the description that allows you to see what they do. The settings differ from allowing you to have larger battles in the campaign with no caps on units, weather effects, for example snow that can slow down units, true reinforcement, which is where you can only reinforce by buildings, titans, day and night cycle, auto reinforce, etc. All of these settings allows you to have more control over how you want to play the campaign and gives you a different way to play when combining these settings with the new fleshed out vanilla races as you can only play those in the campaign. But by far one of the biggest updates that comes with the unification mod that applies to the campaign and the other game modes is to the AI. They don't piss about. If you tick the settings AI advanced tactics, this makes the AI play like an actual player. They will use different abilities that their units have, repair their base as soon as you start attacking them and also will completely relocate their base forcing you to look around the map. If you then also tick the other setting AI map DB, this improves the overall AI pathing, getting less stuck and being more of a threat overall. And that's just for the AI in the campaign. Some of the tactics the AI use in survival mode is insane, which I will touch on when we get to it. 
I have noticed that when playing the Stronghold missions, you don't see many of the new units compared to when playing a Victory Point or Annihilation mission, but it's still nice to see the new models in the cinematics and when playing. One quality of life setting is the Enable Campaign basis. One thing that was really frustrating about the campaign was if you had built a lot on a map, then left and came back for another fight, it would have got rid of some buildings. With this setting on, everything you previously did on that mission will stay, just a nice touch. Overall, you'll notice the campaign configurator and the unification mod changes more in non-stronghold missions. AI relocate their base, they'll use titans, and seriously try to attack you early and recapture points and harass. Combine this with the new models and units and it really is a fun experience. Obviously, a lot of people want the 17 races slash factions to be in the campaign, allowing for the ultimate experience. As of right now, you can't, but I believe this is something they are working on in the future. It seems the Demon Hunters and Tyranids might be coming to campaign next. Survival mode is awesome. And it's one of the game modes that I feel has had a lot of work put into it. There's two ways you can play it, attack and defend. Defend is where you set up a defense against 10 waves of enemies, like Dawn of War 2 Last Stand, but you get a whole army this time. Over the 10 waves, the enemies increase in number and also with better units, and shit gets really fucking hard. Even the devs said themselves, if you have the bollocks, go up against the Emperor's children on hardest difficulty. Now you may say, why is it so hard? Well, the AI start getting very smart. Firstly, the enemy will try to send transport vehicles towards your stronghold, deploying little sabotage squads that if you're not checking, your base will be killed without you noticing. If you're up against demons, they open warp rifts and drop a great unclean one in your back line like it's normal, or any other greater demon. The Eldar also do this with warp gates spawning units in your back line or send warp spiders. The Tyranids will burrow from underneath into your back line and also cover the sky in darkness, shooting spores everywhere, damaging units and buildings. The Sisters of Battle send Avenging Angels which can't even be killed, but instead distract your units so they're not shooting enemies they can kill. Heroes never die. It's endless, but I won't spoil each of the race slash factions in survival. Now, you may go and fortify like an Imperial Fist and expect the enemy to come to you. Well, the AI then realises that a head-on assault won't work, and starts focusing on using range and artillery to destroy you from afar, forcing you to come out of your defence to kill them. In survival mode, the AI does have bases that you can kill, but if you push the AI, it really doesn't like that. Against Orcs, it spawned three Stompers and six Squigoths just for me getting close. Whilst on Defend, you also have objectives. This can be finding war gear on the map that you need to bring your commander to for getting a buff, capturing and holding a critical location will provide you with reinforcements regularly, assassinating the enemy warlord, and also pushing and destroying the enemy base, if you can. The attack side of survival is also very fun. The AI defends a part of the map and its defences get stronger and stronger. You have AI waves, almost like League of Legends or Dota, that spawns and helps you. This won't be enough to beat the enemy, but combine it with your force and you will be able to push through. In terms of size, you can do 1v1, 2v1, 3v1, so if you have friends, <laughs> you can play this. There are a lot of survival maps on snow, desert, city, also some survival maps do the law justice. Do you want to assault the Eternal Fortress on the Iron Cage map as the Imperial Fists? Well, you can do that. How about fight off High Fleet Behemoth on the battle for McCrag? There's my good boys. Or High Fleet Kraken on the defence of Iyandan. One criticism I do have of survival mode, and this applies to other maps as well, is getting your endgame units out. Some titans and lords require a critical location, and some maps either have the critical location deep in the enemy lines, or some maps don't even have a critical location, preventing you from getting your endgame units. Just a small critique, but you will learn which maps are better designed, and some vanilla ones will ruin the experience in Skirmish. The last stand experience has been a bit weird for me, but I definitely see what they were going for. You pick one of the last stand maps and select one of the three squads or a commander and then go up against waves of enemies. You can then fight with or without AI and I recommend AI as it can get very hard. After each wave you gain currency that allows you to upgrade equipment on your character or squad. The problem I have with this game mode is after sinking 1500 hours into Dawn of War 2 Retribution, I find nothing can compare to that last stand game mode. If you haven't played Dawn of War 2 Last Stand, you might like this, but I can't really complain because this is still more content than Dawn of War 3 got. The balancing in Last Stand definitely needs a bit more love, as fighting with AI can be hard enough, and without AI, even harder. And I hate saying that because that's my preference and everyone might not experience it. Maybe this game mode is more designed for having friends, but I find myself never able to clutch rares or make a dent with a commander. The Terminators with autocannons were the only thing that I found stood a chance. 
Overall, I think this game mode is better with friends, so I can't really judge, but honestly, I can't see myself playing it as much as the survival mode. Commander Boreal, enemy forces in our perimeter. Where? Southern Quadrant, but they were on the move. Current location unknown. There is no time to be lost. Battle, Marines! So the Space Marines got a lot of new models, pretty much all of them, from Scout Marines to Terminators, adding bigger backpacks and knives for the Scout models, and purity seals for the rest of the units. For existing models like Captain Boreal or your Force Commander, he gets all his upgrades from the Soulstorm campaign, allowing him to be upgraded how you wish. Assault Marines can be upgraded with Melter Guns, and it's a nice anti-vehicle tool if you need it, but more importantly you can upgrade the Predator with a Conversion Beam Projector, which is pre-heresy tech from the Dark Age of Technology, and this acts as one of your tools to help kill Titans. Speaking of Titans, for new units you get the Warhound Titan, Vulcan Mega Bolters are its DACA, which are great against infantry, but you can upgrade to a Turbo Laser Destructor if you need more power. Personally, I recommend one of each, it just allows the Titan to be better overall. It's protected by two Void Shield Generators, making it very tanky, but it also has two abilities, Stomp, crushing any enemies around it, and Juggernaut, where the driver doesn't give a shit and just rams over everything. The other new unit is the Honor Guard, which have replaced the Grey Knights since they have their own faction now. They're an elite unit, great at holding the line or focusing enemy lords, they're immune to psychology and also have a Vortex Grenade that can destroy the morale of enemy units. You can also upgrade them with a Standard Bearer, preventing morale loss on nearby units. Why are those not in total War Warhammer yet? Just plain heresy. Space Marines did not have too much added, more quality of life and remodels, but Team Thubmizer have said that they're on their list of ones to give love to. Here we go! Green is best. The first race I ever collected in Warhammer 40k was Orcs, back when I painted like I was blind and also made up my own rules for the game. But in the unification mod, Orcs in my opinion are one of the most well balanced races. They did get new units, but I don't feel like it shifted the Orc power curve at all. If anything, they're underpowered, especially when going up against the Empress fucking children. Orcs got a lot of remodels. This mostly involves sticking more spikes and metal jaws on everything, or cosplaying as a Skyrim character, but I do like the new knobs, especially with their power claws. They're much better than those long fingernails previously. For upgrades to existing models, Gorguts gets his campaign equipment, turning him into a walking banner. The first new unit for the Orcs is the Commando Squad. These guys are modelled beautifully. They can be upgraded with a knob leader that also has a little Gretchen sitting in his backpack. Also with either burners, rocket launchers or big shooters, to cater to the enemy you want them to fight. The next is the Weird Boy, which is just done amazing. He has quite a few abilities, first he has a passive, Warpath, this increases the attack speed of all nearby units. He then has three abilities, Raw of Mork, this causes fire damage and lowers morale. Also the fire effects in Unification mod are sick as hell. The Fists of Gork buff nearby units armor penetration, which affects both melee and range damage around the Weird Boy. Lastly, the Crunch, which is your foot of Gork or Mork from Total War Warhammer, stuns units and deals massive damage in a small area. These abilities then need to recharge, but you can speed this up by using Maniacal my my Fuck this word. You can speed this up with Maniacal Seizure. This makes the Weird Boy unable to move or attack, and also debuffs nearby friendly units, dealing less damage and also taking more damage in, but will greatly speed up the ability recharge time, so you want to use this in between combat if possible. The last thing on the Weird Boy is the lovely death animations and effects. It's stuff like this people forget to mention where people put the work in. I actually did buy a Stomper once, that was very expensive plastic crack. The Stomper is one of your relic units and you can choose between this and the Squigoth. The Stomper has four weapons, Belly Cannon, Daka Cannon, Head Zap Cannon and Lifter Dropper. Since it has no shield you will need to keep it healed, luckily it can also store up to two squads in its belly, so I recommend some Gretchen for when you need to heal it. I love the effects as well, the smoke and sparks make it seem like the Stomper is about to explode. Sadly, there's no upgrades, and I would have loved one with a giant claw or chainsaw being more melee focused, but I guess that's what the squig off is for. Before we get to the Gargant, I just want to say I love the bigger mega workshop. Seeing all the sparks and electricity truly has that orky feel. Whilst the Gargant is not as fast or as mobile as an Imperial or Eldar Titan, it can still pack a punch. Two mega cannons, one giant belly cannon, one head zapper. 
It also has three abilities, Juggernaut where it can ram into everything and it can also ship mines, but more importantly it has a supercharged force field. <laughs> I love that laugh so much, top notch voice acting. But anyway this makes it almost invulnerable to range attacks, but it only lasts for a short time so once again keeps some Gretchen in its belly. Now for some space elves. To me my kin! I love that the Eldar in a game from 2004 have gotten newer models compared to Games Workshop's actual model lineup. Will we ever see a new avatar of Kane or Warlock that's still made of metal? Probably not. Sorry Eldar players. But you guys should play the Eldar in the Unification mod instead. The Eldar are one of the most finished races in the Unification mod that got a lot of love. The Banshees matched the newer models from the Games Workshop lineup with red hair going behind instead of looking spiky and also moved much nicer than the vanilla ones. The Seer Council look much more like the ones from Dawn of War 2 with the singing spears as their weapons and they're a really powerful unit in the game. I've seen them go up against Titans and hold the line. One of the biggest and best remodels in the Unification mod was to the Wraith Lord. The old one was just weird with big hands but this one is more on par with the current one for Games Workshop. It can be upgraded with a Bright Lance as well so if you want it anti-vehicle tailored you can do that. The Avatar of Kane also got a remodel, <laughs> take the hint Games Workshop, but it's a little bit taller than the vanilla one I think. Still does the job though, as a defender or a tank for the main front line. In terms of new units, the first one which I'm a big fan of is the Shadow Spectres. I can actually see these ones unlike the Dawn of War 3 ones. Also the voice acting and sound effects are just lovely. They don't take terrain penalties and remain concealed when not moving, but also have a diffused fire mode making them better against infantry than vehicles for a short amount of time. Your orders, child. Huh, how do they know? Unfortunately my mental age hasn't catched on with my physical. The next new unit is the Wraith Blades, equipped with Ghost Blade and Force Shield. They are a beast in combat, but if you want them even more powerful, you can upgrade them with a Spirit Seer and two Ghost Blades, making them even faster and causing double the damage. Their partners in crime, the Wraith Guard, are a great support slash siege unit. They can be upgraded with Bright Lances, Star Cannons and even more to cater to the situation. That can be Splash Damage, Range Damage, Armor Piercing Damage, Vehicle Damage. I feel like I'm reading a Total War Warhammer stat card. Now, now little one, maybe someday. The Wraith Guard and Blades are two units that work really well together and they're not overpowered, unlike the Dawn of War 2 ones. I love the Wraith Knight. At this point you're probably thinking that I want to suck off the modders, but I can't say how well these models are made. The Wraith Knight is the Relic unit for the Eldar and you can keep it on the front line as a melee fighter or upgrade it with either Wraith Cannons for AoE or Sun Cannons for single targets. This thing even has its own sync kills. The last is the Revenant Titan. Its weapons are Pulsar laser weapons that can be upgraded to armor piercing sonic lances. This Titan also has two abilities, Enhanced Wraith Bone Regeneration which uses up power but also makes it slower but restores health. Gravitic Boost makes the Titan less accurate but really fast and I believe it's the fastest unit in the game. I don't think you have any idea how fast I really am. I'm fast as fuck, boy. <laughs> I'm fast as fuck. Let's talk about chaos. <laughs> the Chaos Space Marines are in a similar situation with the Space Marines. They still need love. They got most of their models redone and a few new ones but are still lacking that anti-tank but that will come in time. In terms of remodels, cultists look far cooler with hoods and gas masks. They're actually starting to look like the kids in the UK that think they're hard. Oh yeah bruv, got some warpstone for you mate. 20 quid or I'll fucking shank ya. One of the bigger remodels was to the obliterators. I was not a fan of the vanilla ones but now they actually look like terminators fused with weapons and demons. They're also really effective against any unit. There's also mutilators if you want a melee version of them. The Predator also got a heavy blight launcher as an upgrade which is good against pretty much infantry and light vehicles. Chaos also got a Chaos Dreadnought. This one can be upgraded with las cannons, plasma cannons or many other weapons to suit any role you want. It also has sync kills which is a nice addition. The last is the Chaos Warhound Titan. Very similar to the OG Warhound with the same abilities but has massive inferno cannons instead that are really good against infantry. But you can also upgrade them to plasma blast cannons for more armor piercing. Let's move on to some humans. You 
You know, I don't think Starship Troopers 3 was so bad. It was an alright film, especially if you just imagine it's the Astra Militarum versus the Tyranids. I feel like I don't give enough love to the Astra Militarum in my videos. I'm still waiting to review Darktide. In the Unification mod, the Guard got some new toys. Firstly, the Bolter turret can be upgraded with different weapons for different enemies. The Medusa has less range than the Basilisk, but better against vehicles and bigger AoE. For your Titan Killer, you have a new Baneblade, the Shadow Sword. That sounds like an anime name. Has a Volcano Cannon for its main weapon, which if you're a Lore Guru, you will know that this is a dedicated Titan Killer. You can also upgrade it to a Quake Cannon, which does more AoE damage and fires faster. And there's also a little human poking out the top. Do you know what this reminds me of? Let's be honest here, if you've not watched Red Dwarf, you're not a true Warhammer fan, enough said. The Imperial Knights are perfect. I feel they even rival the Dawn of War 3 models, also voiced by Norn Queen Alexis, which is cool. Thou calls to me. Mortal steeds wish they were this fleet. The Knights have way more customization than the Dawn of War 3 ones, from thermal, lightning and gatling cannons to double chainswords. How can a mod do more justice? Whilst talking about customization, the Lemon Russes, uh, that was a really shit joke still, pretty much have any upgrade you can think of. Huntsman, Conqueror, Demolisher, Annihilator, Exterminator, etc. They have all of them. I do believe the Imperial Guard are going to be getting some more love via aircraft, so look forward to that in the future. Let's move on to the Necrons. It's not fair! That should have been our expansion! It was ours! Why didn't they give it to us? It still hurts to this day. The Necrons got the most changes and love out of all the vanilla races. Where the hell do I start on them? Firstly, the Necron remodels are probably the best. Compared to the vanilla ones, they look way more metallic and also now match the Indomitus Necrons with the Gauss Flayers and also can be upgraded to the Gauss Reapers, which is a nice addition. They somehow made the flayed ones look even more disturbing. Hmm, grim dark. <laughs> The Immortals also match the Indomitus Necrons and can be upgraded as well with a Tesla Carbine. There's also the Death Marks now. We all know how cancer these guys were in Mechanicus. Fucking Overwatch. But they also have quite a funny ability, Dimensional Translocate. This allows them to not attack, but also move very quick. I take it back, these guys are the fastest unit in the game over the Revenant Titan. They can cross half the map and also get into the enemy's base in an instant with the ability. For other new units, you've got the Tomb Blade, a fast attack, and the Canoptek Spider. This one's a bit beefier than the Tomb Spider and can reanimate different units such as the Death Marks. For Anti-Tank, you've got the Annihilation Barge, which can also be upgraded with a Tesla Cannon. And for Anti-Titan, you've got the Doomsday Arc, which also has an ability, High Power Outage. This increases the damage, but lowers the movement speed. <laughs> That's the sound every Necron player made, laughing at all the other Xenos races not getting their new models. There's a setting that if you turn on gives you access to the Ancient Pyramid. This allows you to choose from one of three dynasties. Each dynasty gives you access to a different Overlord and their bodyguards which can be the Lich Guard or the Crypto Thralls. The Necrons also get two more Katan than just the Nightbringer, the Deceiver and the Void Dragon. The Void Dragon is better used as a flanker or frontline attacker. It has no abilities and also has a bit of a visual bug at the moment, but nothing to kill yourself over. The Deceiver is far better used as a support Katan. It has two abilities, Deceive, which forces an enemy infantry unit to join your side, and also Grant Illusion, that spawns a fake monolith. Also, the monoliths now look like the newer ones. Before we get onto the Titan, just look at the size of this building. Honestly, it's like the Necrons are trying to build an Empire State building for spawning their Titan. Also, just listen to the sound effects and animations of it spawning the Titan. The Necron Titan is the Seraptic Heavy Construct, and I won't lie, it's pretty shit in melee, but it does decent range damage. The Necrons are also getting a remodeled Eonic Orb. The problem is, they keep adding stuff to this mod, which I have to keep covering in this video. It feels like this video is never ending for me. The youngest race in 40k is up next. Are we rushing in? 
What are we going sneaky beaky like? Moving on to everyone's favourite weeaboo race, they got new fire warriors, which are more of an AoE shotgun variant, but their main thing in the unification mod is the new battle suits. One cool thing about the battle suits is they count as infantry and not vehicle, so you might want to kill a few of your infantry units to make space for them. The ghost kill being a sneaky beaky suit can turn invisible for as long as you want, and can also flank very easily to harass. In terms of weapons, you've got all the different upgrades, you can also upgrade it with the marker and shield drone for added protection and accuracy. Look how cute those drones are. The Yavara battle suit is more suited for close range combat, it's great against infantry and vehicles, it also does damage to units when using its jump ability. Its counterpart the Yavana battle suit lacks the mobility of the Yavana but makes up for it with more damage. Does anyone remember the day the Riptide came out? That was when everyone wanted to play Tau. The Riptide I would say is your second strongest all round battle suit, it can jump around the map and upgrade to an iron accelerator or smart missile system. If you're looking for more DACA you can upgrade it with a pulse accelerator drone making it fire faster. In vanilla Dawn of War, the biggest battle suit you had was the broadside. Well, now you have the Storm Surge, and it's a beast in combat. If you don't trench it, it fires more missiles than any other unit, just like the tabletop, their turn never ends. If you do entrench it, the Pulse Driver Cannon has huge range, and is your Titan Killer. The tower are really fun with the new battle suits, and if you start marker lighting everything, well, it's GG. Let's talk about the nuns with guns. Fight the enemy! They shall fear the Emperor's divine wrath. After looking at the new Sisters of Battle model reveals, I'm hoping that they make their way into a game at some point. In the Unification mod, they also got remodels, more shiny armour and textures, the commander also got her upgrades from the campaign. Pius Vaughan also makes an appearance from the Blackstone Fortress, which is a nice addition. In Vanilla, their most powerful unit was the Living Saint. Well, now you have the Archangel, which is basically a greater demon of the Emperor, and I love the voice acting. Where will you need the blessing of the Emperor? Onward, in the name of the Emperor! The Archangel also has a passive, Divine Resurrection, which is pretty damn broken in my opinion. Each time she dies, she has a chance to be resurrected, so if you're lucky, this unit may never die. Are you kidding me? I just checked the Discord and they're already working on more than Vow and Paragons. You guys will have this out before GW even released the model at this rate. Well, it seems the sisters have a lot more content on the way, so I guess you can look forward to that. Dark Eldar time. The Dark Eldar have been one of the more challenging reworks in the Unification mod, being pretty much untouched by the modern community and also not being fleshed out in vanilla, similar to the Eldar, they've had a lot of love. They still have the same game mechanics of building slave pits, but they got a lot of remodels as well, and I won't boggle you down with all of them because you can play for yourself. What I will talk about is the new units, you got racks, no uh, not that rack, these racks, the twisted mutations of Clan Mulder, oh fuck that's fantasy. Racks can't capture points, but they can decapture points very fast, very tanky and can deal a lot of damage and negative morale. I can now see why the Dark Elves are good at pleasuring each other. Next we have the Trueborn, which are the Dark Elves who are made in the natural way, if you can say that about Dark Elf society. They are the elite warriors, great at ranged combat and can be upgraded with splinter rifles and dart lances, etc for any enemy. For your titan killer you have the reaper, fast moving and with its storm vortex projector cannon it's great at killing titans. For your titan you have the void raven bomber, a big flying unit, you can switch between anti infantry and anti armour and also has a void mine. One thing you will notice in this mod is big flying units can look a little bit wonky. This is purely down to the map and the pathing as the game wasn't built to accommodate these big flying units. So take that in mind, but it will look stupid. And that's the vanilla race is done. My PC is literally already on the verge of exploding. Bruh. When it comes to the new races and factions, some are very well fleshed out and have a lot of units, mechanics and titans. For others, they feel like they're lacking a few units and don't have titans to match the other ones. But take all of this with a grain of salt because some of these were made a long time ago and will be getting reworks. So who do we start with? <laughs> oh, there's that. If you didn't get the hint, salamanders like fire, 
and their entire faction is based around it, from the turrets to the resource posts. If they're not saving lives or spending time with their family, the salamanders will be burning things. Pretty much all of their roster can upgrade to some sort of flame weapon, from infantry to dreadnoughts and predators. The salamanders are tougher than any other space marine chapter, but they are very slow. They also seem to have gotten a lot more love than the standard space marines. I never thought I'd see Primaris in Dawn of War, but here we are. The aggressives can be upgraded with flame gauntlets and fragstorm launchers, just like the tabletop. Also, we even have the eradicators. It's crazy to me how fast the modders can work. The eradicators can be upgraded with melter guns to be anti-armor. There are many endgame units as well. The Storm Raven gunship can transport troops across the map into the enemy base. The Sakara and Punisher tank for anti-infantry. You then have the Fire Drake squad, and they have an upgrade which gives you their chapter master, Tushan, arguably the nicest space marine in 40k. Ah. Lord Vulcan is extremely tanky, and he has two abilities, Scorch the Earth, which melts anything in front of him, and Melt or Orbital Strike, which does what it says on the tin. If they ever do make Total War Warhammer 40k, Vulcan better get the option to hug for better diplomacy. Let's move on to the Sons of Dawn. The Imperial Fists are a great fleshed out chapter in this mod. They have two playstyles, sieging or fortifying, because no one would have guessed that. If you're sieging, which I don't even know if that's a real word, I've given up on the English language as you can tell from my videos, to focus on getting siege marines. They have a passive that allows them to capture posts faster than any other space marine. If you add a siege captain, they can do it even faster. The siege marines with their shields are a great frontline assault unit, and they can soak up a lot of damage. After that, try and get your dedicated siege weapons and support out, apothecary for marines, and get siege dreadnoughts to soak up even more damage and to try and break the front line with their seismic slam. Don't focus on going for predators and land raiders next, instead get vindicators out and more dedicated siege weapons like terminators and centurions. The centurions look amazing and you can get melee or range versions, but I recommend melee for sieging. Your end game for sieging is the Cestus Assault Ram and the Mastodon, which is a land raider on steroids, for transporting troops into the enemy base. It's nice seeing a lot of units from the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy. Lastly, get Siege Masters, which is straight from the tabletop, so good on you lore and tabletop guys for adding this, which allows bolters to ignore cover and walls. Tis beautiful. If you're fortifying your position and being a little bitch waiting for the enemy to come to you, you need to go for a different playstyle. Focus on getting the standard Space Marine squads and capturing the nearest points to you. Get your Siege Generator up as quickly as possible. One benefit the Imperial Fists have is they don't have as many buildings as other factions, and the Siege Generator counts as all your power, so keep it safe. Since you're looking to fortify, find the best choke. Set up walls, set up heavy bolter turrets or auto cannons. Focus then on getting range units out like devastators and destroyers with their experimental weapons. Ideally, you're looking to create a wall of guns that will make even the tower blush. For vehicles, you can't go wrong with the Whirlwind Scorpius and the Predators. For the late game, get one of the heavy tanks, be it the Fellblade or the Falchion. They pack a big punch. Rogal Dawn looks so miserable. Very lore friendly. Since Dawn is one piece in this mod, you can have him play a few different roles. Go toe to toe with demons and titans, support troops with the hold your ground ability which makes them take less damage, or call down doom with the mighty phalanx. If you get the Primaris Rubicon research, you can also get the Sons of Dawn which are Primaris Marines. They also have a setting that allows you to have different types of weapons. The last thing I want to mention on the Imperial Fists is the buildings. They are really nice and even though I know some are reused models, going the extra mile on them does make a difference when playing. The Imperial Fists can also fortify every building, increasing their health. How cool is that? Also, make sure you do this for the Siege Generator, as that's how you increase the power outage. Let's move on to the Vampires. Sanguinius guides us. I have not got too much to say about the Blood Angels. Their mod was made in 2016, but it still holds up really well, but it is lacking a few of the newer remodels and newer units like Primaris. Their faction is based around relics, just not stealing them. Like the Necron Dynasty, you can choose between the Might of Sanguinius or the Speed of Sanguinius, allowing you to choose either a hit and run playstyle with land speeders and storm ravens, or a more tanky approach with land raiders. They have their faction units like the Bow Predator and the Furiso Dreadnought, but really it's the main characters from the Blood Angels that are the strength of the army. Captain Tycho, Chief Librarian Mephiston, Commander Dante, they each have their own abilities and upgrades which can make them even more powerful. Most of these consist of giving the unit more health, being faster or doing more damage. 
Of course, when going up against other races and factions, they have no Titan, so struggle in the late game since Dante can't kill all of them. But honestly, this is a great foundation of the Blood Angels, and I'm sure the modders will get around to finishing them, but I can tell it's not their priority right now. Anyway, let's move on to the Dark Angels. The Dark Angels are fucking nuts. This faction has way too much content to even cover. It's basically a three in one faction. Aside from the standard Dark Angel Space Marine squads, upgrades, dreadnoughts and vehicles, it's all very similar, but you get to a point where you have to choose one of three options. The Fury of the Ravenwing, the Might of the Deathwing, and the Power of the Battle Company. Each of these offers a different playstyle, unlocking and locking certain units. For example, if you choose the Fury of the Ravenwing, you become the Harley Davidson faction and could even race against the Orcs for fun. This gives you access to commanders with bikes, tech marines with bikes, Ravenwind bikes, land speeders of the Ravenwing, and Samuel, Grandmaster of the Ravenwing. Each of these has their own upgrades and abilities, which gives the Dark Angels a more hit and run playstyle. It's quite fun getting a load of bikes. <laughs> They won't make a big punch in the late game, so you get access to the Thunderhawk. I'm starting to think that maybe they are spreading the Primaris and Space Marine units over all the factions, so one does not have all of them, which I think is a smart thing to do. The Thunderhawk is great at being used as a transport or just holding the line as an absolute beast. If you love Terminators, take the Might of the Deathwing. This gives Commanders and Tech Marine Terminator armor and also gives you access to deep striking units. This consists of many different types of Terminators, Tactical and Assault Terminators with all their upgrades, you've got Master of the Deathwing, Belial, you also have a Deathwatch Kill Team in Terminator armor that has all the upgrades, last the Deathwing Company Champion. He can spawn Deathwing Knights as your ultimate unit, and they are tanky as fuck, but you also can get a Watch in the Dark, whatever that thing is. Lastly, the power of the Battle Command has more of a focus on infantry, but still has some vehicles. You get access to the Veteran Squad, Assault and Ranged, and they have all their upgrades. Being the Battle Command, you get a lot of characters. Azrael, the Keeper of Truth, Asmodai, the Interrogator, Master Lazarus, Ezekiel, they all have their own abilities and buffs. You can truly see how much Lord Justice the modders are doing. The Company Command also gets Hellblasters. They start with Bolters, but can be upgraded to different variations of the Plasma Incinerators, just like the Tabletop. You modders are nuts by the amount of depth this mod is going into. Endgame for the Company Command is the Land Raider Ares and the Free Blade Knight Vortigan, known for serving alongside the Dark Angels. Vortigan also gets access to different weapons than other knights, some from the Dark Age of Technology, like, uh, give me a break, my dyslexia can't handle that word. Let's move on to the Black Templars. The Black Templar mod is old, but it's still fun to burn your enemies. I would say currently it has more content than the Blood Angels, but it's not quite up to par with the Dark Angels. They have their faction units like the Crusaders, the Castellan in charge of the Crusade, Sword Brethren squads and the Land Raider Crusader. Their faction, as you guessed, involves around getting into close combat as quickly as possible. In order to make this more effective, they have access to four vows of the Black Templars. Each gives a different buff. Uphold the honor of the Emperor, which gives a damage resistance. Uphold the Witch, destroy the Witch, gives an increased speed around the landing site. Suffer not the unclean to live, gives improved strength in combat, but slowers the attacks. Accept any challenge, no matter the odds, increase accuracy in combat. I don't really have too much more to say about the Black Templars. Surprisingly, their AI has been the best against the Empress Children so far. I'm interested to see what they get in the future if they do. Space puppy time. Come on, Space Wolf players. Let's just admit we're all in denial furries. Let's take our heresy with pride. Not again. The 13th Company is definitely a cool addition to the mod, and it definitely does justice to the lore. Being the company that went missing in the warp, they don't have the fancy tanks, the Primaris or the super heavy titans. Instead, they rely more on standard infantry, Wolfin and the Wolves of Fenris. This obviously does handicap them quite a bit against other factions and races. Not as handicapped as the Wolfin look though. You picking on my boyfriend? But I really do like the Wolves, and they're still a fun faction to play, but you have limited buildings and options when playing. Even with their limited roster, you have to choose between a Wolf Lord which gives Wolves and Wolfin, or a Terminator Wolf Lord that gives Predators and Terminators. 
The modders may be already doing this, but I feel make the 13th company a side faction of the Space Wolves if you ever make them. This means that people can choose to go for that more old school route or stick with the up to date models. I just don't think the 13th company will be enough on their own in this mod. If they are going to be separate, give them Thunder Wolf Cavalry, maybe some Horus Heresy or Dark Age tech, and even as far as to say Lehman Russ. It's a mod, so why not? But I'm a bit of a Space Wolf fan, so this faction is fine with me. But really, they've let themselves go in the hobby. Let's move on to the Legion. The Legion of the Damned is definitely a hard faction to create in Dawn of War, and I think Team Thubmizer have done a good job of making them playable. Considering they show up to a fight at any time and are basically invulnerable and have no need of structures or anything, it's not easy to create. The way they play in Dawn of War is they have no resources or power, you have a portal of the damned which you can get units from which cost nothing to produce. You can upgrade the portal to get better units like Dreadnoughts and Land Raiders out, but this makes the portal become more unstable, and right from the start it loses health, and the only way to stabilise the portal is by getting listening posts up. If you upgrade the portal it starts losing health again and requires more listening posts to become more stable again or gain health. There's a simple tier list that shows how many listening posts you need at each tier level. There's not really much more to say about the Legion of the Damned, and I was not sure if they'd be part of the Space Marine faction, but having them on their own is still cool, and they're fun to have as an AI in survival mode. Personally, I've always liked the idea that the Legion of the Damned are a manifestation of the Emperor's Rage and the Firehawks, and I'm disappointed in the modders that there's no Nicolas Cage model. Shame on you guys getting my hopes up. I think it's time we talk about some heresy. We serve mighty Zenich, architect of fate, lord of change, the great schemer. Ah, the Thousand Sons, Zeech's Sandy Boys. This faction is great. The buildings, the units, all fit perfectly. They have a similar building mechanic to the Dark Eldar, where they only have to have one builder touch a building and then it will carry on automatically. This helps with building multiple structures quickly. Since Rubik Marines are full of sand, this applies to their gameplay mechanics. They suffer no morale loss and are very tanky. This does have its negatives though. They can't capture resource posts, also are extremely slow and inaccurate. This means you have to use the Zinch Cultists to capture points around the map, which are very weak. The Sorcerers who control the Rubik Marines are a big part of the Thousand Sun roster. You've got the Exalted Sorcerers on their little discs riding across the map. You've got the Chosen that have spells and psychic powers that you can research doing different abilities, mostly involving debuffing, damaging or protecting the Sorcerers. You've then got the Sorcerer Lords who have access to spellbooks, and you can choose to either focus on Illusionist, Summoner or Warlock. Each of these unlocks different spells for your sorcerer, but you can only choose one. For example, Summoner allows you to conjure lesser demons of Zinch into the world, and this can be upgraded to greater ones. One interesting thing about the Thousand Suns is they have a toggle menu. This allows you to see abilities and upgrades on two separate pages. I think this is so you don't get confused when looking at them. You also get Azek Araman, and he has access to many different spells in his book, but you can only choose three. But each time he respawns, you can change it. These spells are very powerful as expected. Some are mutated marines, called out meteor swarms. The playstyle of the Thousand Suns is very much a glass cannon build. You get Rubik marines and dreadnoughts on the front line as tanks, and then behind them you have your glass cannon, sorcerers and demons doing the damage. For the late game you get a combination of both. You get a Zinch demon prince which has abilities like breathing fire and stealing life from other units, and the giant chicken lord of change. The Lord of Change has very destructive abilities and is very tanky, but focusing one unit is not really its strong suit. It's better for crowd control. I will unleash destruction. Let's talk about the World Eaters. Death for the Death Lord! Let the Red River flow! I can't believe how much work has gone into the World Eaters. This faction is nuts, literally. I will slaughter them all! Every single unit seems like a demon has fucked a vehicle to create an unholy offspring. Or one of the modders said, how many weapons do you want? And the other just said, yes. One mechanic of the World Eaters is you have access to Mr. Korn himself. There's a blood tribute in the top left corner which if you fill, Korn will allow you to use abilities. These abilities can be simple things like increasing the attack speed of units and not allowing a unit to use abilities, to forcing the enemies to kill each other from Korn's rage. You can fill up the blood tribute by killing or getting your units killed. Korn doesn't care what the blood flows. 
I love how there's something as simple as core marines shooting each other, just showing the lust to kill something. You can build any corn army you want, and I truly mean that. You can go for a blood cultist theme army with melee, range, veterans and commanders. Or how about a corn marine theme either for siege, assault and crusade, with corn terminators and even the red butchers trapped in their armour. You've then got cornate marines, berserkers and havocs, all of their chosen variants. I can't believe corn berserkers are still rocking those tiny ass models on the tabletop. What am I saying? Of course I can, it's Games Workshop. You can get a Cornate Lord with any upgrade you can think of, Terminator armor or jump pack with many weapons to choose from. Corn Dreadnoughts and Berserker ones just asking to kill something. And for the late game you can get a Chaos Sakara and Battle Tank. Not interesting enough? Well how about have a Hellforge army by the Dark Mechanicus? You can get a Bloodsmith that can build Servitors and the Beast, basically Eddie Hall and a Dreadnought. I don't know everyone takes the piss but I am just constantly dehydrated. Possess tanks, which I don't even know how to describe, basically a blender with wheels, the good old Hell Drake, and also a Kaitan Ravager. It's a lord of skulls with legs. Let's just hope Marnaeus Kalgar is nowhere near. Still want more? Go for a demon army. Flesh hounds, blood letters, blood crushers, get a lord of corn and a herald of corn to lead. I'm amazed how well these look for a mod. The commander can also spawn some favoured blood letters. For the late game, get a corn demon prince or a bloodthirster. Still want more? How about an army of knights with the Rampager and the Desecrator? Obviously you can choose any one of these themes to play or mix and match units. The next option is when you can't be asked to even touch your keyboard and want to just relax, the Bane Lord Titan. They're trying to lay siege. <laughs> these are the units that cause the engine to start having a mental breakdown. You can leave this thing on autopilot and not have to worry, go for a piss if you want to. It's a one man army but it costs the whole army to produce and you can't build anything else. Still not enough heresy for you, let's move on to the Empress Children. Finally we get to talk about arguably the most broken faction in survival mode, the Empress Children, the Sons of Thorgrim, the noisiest faction in the mod, playing their sonic guitars. A little survival tip, bud. Never play your guitar in front of a man with a loaded gun. The Emperor's Children have a lot of content and their models are pure heresy, but also very Sineshi. Mmm. You have demonettes pretty much just sitting on every vehicle chilling, which I find funny. And what the fuck is this? Also, whichever modder decided to add a jump scare with them is a prick, and you legit scared the shit out of me with that stupid PNG image. Well played, well played. Pretty much every single unit can have some sort of sonic weapon, their turrets, their listening posts, vehicles, all have them. And there are so many ways you can play the Empress Children. Where do I even start? And I thought the Dark Angels had a lot of content. You basically have two factions inside of two factions here. You can play as the Legion or the Sisters, and then in both of those you can ask for House Glaw for support, changing the playstyle once again. You can build as normal, get noise marines out that have combat jugs that make them even more insane and better fighters, Saneshi lords, later get predators and sonic scorpions, however then you have to choose. If you choose the legion, this will give you access to the Empress children better weapons and units. You get chosen noise marines and havocs with their upgrades and abilities, Saneshi lords gain terminator armour, also you get the phoenix guard terminators with their upgrades as well. Warp talons, jet bikers, icon bearers. The leader of course is Lucius the Eternal and he can spawn a Cacophoni squad. This squad has characters you might recognise if you read the novels like Fabius Bile and Teak the Smiling One. You can also get an orchestrator and a soloist, each with their own abilities. You can upgrade the soloist with his guitar as well. There's Kill Team Noise Marines, Sonic Dreadnoughts, the Apothecaries have a really cool ability. Since we know that Traitor Legions have a huge interest in Rubicon Primaris, you can actually have an Apothecary go round to Fallen Units and pick up their Gene Seed, and once he has enough, he can call in a group of Primaris Space Marines. How cool is that? For the late game you get a Party Raider, and fitting with the Celeste theme, a Quester Class Titan, looking very fucked up with tits for guns. This applies to both the Sisters and the Legion, but of course you get your Demons of Selesh as well, but I won't go into too much details on them and keep them for Demons of Chaos. If you get House Glaw for the Legion, you really don't get too much compared to the Sisters. You get a Land Rapier, yeah I, I mean, there's no way that's the actual name for this, I mean come on who the fuck named that? The Land Rapier is more of a Titan killer with its Laz Cannons, also you can deliver House Glaw agents into the battlefield in the coolest way via a Valkyrie. Seeing the Sisters of Excess makes me want to make a Sisters of Battle army devoted to Selesh. If you choose the Fallen Sisterhood, you get a bunch of different units to the Legion. 
the Sisters of Sanesh, the Sisters of Excess with their upgrades, you can get a Battle Sister as a Slave Law. You have Fallen Sisters on Jet Bikes and a Pleasure Giver or a Converted Immolator. Their leader is Miriel Sabathiel and she was the first sister to fall to Sanesh. She can summon an Avatar of Sanesh but you can also summon a Demon of Sanesh as well. Late game you can get a Subjugator Titan and a Noise Blade, but if you get House Glaw, this instead gives you a Noise Sword and a House Divine Knight trading the power of the Titan for a more flexible Knight. This Knight has got many upgrades so you can customise it for any situation. Now I know what you're thinking, where's Fulgrim? Well... Well, bollocks. I might as well get an important message to Relic. Let's try this again. Alright, fuck it. I can't be arsed. No Fulgrim today, lads. All jokes aside, this is like the third time I've tried this and you have to build everything before you can get Fulgrim out. Why don't we move on to demons? Inquisitor to banish us. Foolish. You overestimate your chances against our vast demon legion. Chaos demons are as you might expect. They're similar to the ones in Apocalypse with all the four gods represented. One thing I have noticed is if you compare the models of the Chaos demons to the Empress Children or World Eater demons, they have different models. I think this is possibly because the Chaos Demons were made before the other two. For example, here's a blood letter of the Chaos Demons, and here's one of the World Eaters. Or a Great Unclean one of the Chaos Demons, and then here's one for the Death Guard, which are not in the game currently. More on them in a bit. So I imagine at some point they may go back and change a few of the models, but it's weird to even think that the models will go back and rework other mods, that's dedication. Chaos Demons have all the demons you can think of from the four gods, from Nurglings, Pink Horrors to the greater demons like the Great Unclean One and the Keeper of Secrets. When you start the match, you will have to choose between minions or greater demons, each have their own benefits and downsides. For example, if you choose minions, this allows you to get way more lesser demons out, increasing the squad cap, it gives buffs and abilities to the lesser demons, and you can also spawn a demonic horde in the late game. However, if you choose Greater Demons, this allows you to get one more Greater Demon on the battlefield, opposed to two from the increased squad cap, abilities and buffs for Greater Demons, and also gives you the opportunity, if you turn on the setting, to spawn Angron. And why wouldn't you want that? Also, why is he here and not in the World Eaters army? Maybe they will add him there later. Angron is basically as you would expect. He's a Demon Primarch dedicated to Khorne, so he can basically go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anything in the game. Also, I'm not going to show it, but Angron crashed my game. What is it with Primarchs crashing the game? I'm starting to think that this is a legit intention from the modders just to show off the power of them. Angron can get other weapons as well, also has the standard damage abilities or buff nearby troop stuff. Man, I hope we see him in tabletop one day. That would be so cool since we're getting hints. I do not hit cornflakes. One other mechanic is you can either choose to go Chaos Undivided or to worship one of the gods. If you choose Chaos Undivided, this locks a few dedicated units to certain gods, but gives you access to the Brass Scorpion and the Soul Grinder. If you choose to worship one of the gods, this will lock off units of another god depending on the one you pick, but give you access to dedicated units to that god and some buffs. For example, if I pick Nurgle, this locks off the units of Zinch, like the Screamers, the Flamers of Zinch, and the Lord of Change. But it gives me Blight Drones and a Desecrator of Nurgle. It also gives my commander a regen buff. Also allows me to spawn a Demon Prince of Nurgle since I chose Nurgle. This applies to each god depending on the one you choose. One other important mechanic is the Warp Signatures. You don't gain power in the normal way and instead convert Requisition into power via these buildings, so it's important to take note of. On to the Abductus Mechanicus. I really like the Abductus Mechanicus Explorators. Being less of a fighting force and more searching for knowledge, here's your sequel to Mechanicus. <laughs> they don't have the full might of Mars behind them and all the new toys that the Abductus Mechanicus have, but instead have a different playstyle with interesting mechanics. And they are very hard to play. <coughs> At least from my experience. If you don't know what you're doing, you will die very quick. 
Servitors are your builders, and you can only make a few things like the machine reliquary and the STC searchers. This is to fit with the theme that they are explorers and don't really stay in one place too long. When you first start, you want to capture a point and get an STC researcher up as quickly as possible. You can then choose between a research centre and a defence post. If you choose the defence post, it gives it a weapon and increases the unit cap for the army. If you choose the research centre, this allows you to focus on upgrades, so think of this as your armoury. It also increases the data link range, so the data link is one of the mechanics of the Mechanicus Explorers. Mechanics of the Mechanicus, for fuck's sake. So the way this works is any unit like Servitors, Hell Stalkers or Visitors have the word Automation. Units with Automation replace Morale with Connection. If these units don't stay near a Machine Reliquary or an STC Searchers, their Morale will start to go down, and once it's hit zero, they can't be commanded. Each Automation does have an Emergency Recharge ability to get back to the Link, but it halves the battery life of them for a small amount of time. These units are better used for defence than being aggressive, until the late game. One other mechanic of the Mechanicus is they don't have generators. Their requisition posts count as power as well, and have an option to switch to power when needed, so it's important to keep track of this and have a good balance. Once you're fully upgraded and gained the power of the Mechanicus, you can get more powerful units out. The Lehman Rust King pattern, which is different every time you get one. A Knight Paladin equipped with Chainsword and Power Fist, but you can upgrade it to other Titan weapons as well. You can either choose between the Knight and the Mobile Machine Reliquary. I would not say it's as powerful as the Knight, but it's very tanky, and to be effective you need to have it shoot broadside. Obviously the benefit of having the Machine Reliquary move is it helps with any unit that needs to stay connected, and you can build units as well. In terms of units, you've got the basic Skatari that can be upgraded with weapons, you can also get an Archmagus Prime as your commander, they also provide a connection for the machines. I'm interested to see if the Unification mod team will add the Adeptus Mechanicus as another faction with more fighting power, or combine it with this. As I thought, it seems Admech will be getting a rework in the future, so I look forward to that. Anyway, let's move on to the Steel Legion. The Steel Legion are not just a reskin of the Guard, which is nice, and I hope we get the other Guard regiments in the mod at some point. I guess you can just reskin them to the regiment you want to a degree. Shovels at the ready. Actually, they do use them to make buildings. The Steel Legion have two playstyles, Mechanized Infantry and Armoured Company. If you choose Mechanized Infantry, this has you focus on elite infantry with vehicles to support. Stormtroopers are more powerful, and they're really fun to deploy anywhere on the map via a Valkyrie. Also, a head-on charge with Rough Riders into Orcs never gets old. Could you imagine if you died by getting stepped on by a horse in 40k? Picking Mechanized Infantry also gives you Commissars to scare, I mean inspire nearby troops. And talking of Commissars, you can also get Commissar Yarrick, so if you want to recreate the War of Armageddon against the Orcs, go for it. Picking Mechanized Infantry will have the vehicles you have access to all be artillery based. For example, the Thunderer and the Basilisk, and for the late game, the Lehman Rust Conqueror and the Storm Sword. If you pick the Armoured Company at the start, you get less infantry but more vehicles. Infantry are more going to be used for capturing points, and that's about it. In terms of vehicles, you can get the Lehman Rust Demolition, Executioner and Exterminator, and for the late game, the Stormblade. That's all I've got to say on the Steel Legion for now, hopefully we get other guard regiments in the future. On to the Harlequins. The Harlequins are one of those weird races you never see in games or on tabletop. In Vanilla Dawn of War they had one unit, in the Unification mod they have an entire faction to themselves. Wow, this is an old mod. Also, can anyone tell me if there's an actual sub-faction of the Harlequins called Black Humor? I'm just curious. Now the Harlequins don't really fight with brute strength, and they more rely on speed and illusions. Their roster is not very large, but once it's fully upgraded, it's a true performance to watch. Haha, <laughs> get the joke. There's confetti jumping everywhere, units dancing into battle, moving at such quick speed, and they can also deflect attacks. That's of course when they're fully upgraded, but they have many abilities as well. All to do with buffing their troops' resistance to damage, or making them even faster, or slowing enemy units and causing damage. I've never really been familiar with any of the Harlequins units. To me, it just seems like they're one big circus. I've seen a few of them, like the Harlequins and a couple of the Flyers, but never things like the Mockingbird, the Wraith Walker, or the Spirit Walker. Let's go on to the Witch Hunters. Let's talk about the Ordo Hereticus, and I'm starting with the buildings because I want to. 
I was fascinated by these, the way they are built and animated fits so well. And I'm going to mention it again, but going the extra mile on these buildings does make a difference instead of just having reskins. Even the resource posts look cool, like a little bunker. The Arbiti Sentinel has a funny easter egg animation. If you wait long enough, you'll see him take a quick swig of his Amasek. The units you start with are really nice. The Arbiti's melee squads can form a shield wall, and they can tank like a beast. Behind them in the early game as well, you can get some Arbiti's fire support. But the Witch Hunters have two ways you can play them. You can either choose to go with the Ecclesiarchy or the Inquisition path. If you choose the Ecclesiarchy, your army will be based around the Adeptus Aurorators. You do get some of the Sisters of Battle units without picking it, but this is more to do with the vehicles and upgrades. You get access to a Repentia squad, which when fully upgraded is really powerful. Give them a Mistress as well. Other units include the Flying Baby Cherubs and the Retributor squad. The vehicles you get are basically the same as the Sisters of Battle ones, which provides more of an incentive to go for the Inquisition path. If you go for the Inquisition path, you get units like, of course, the Archaeoflagellants. 40k, where being executed is a nice way to go. You also get the Penitent Engines. Some of the elite units you can get is from the Officio Assassinorum Inquiry. These assassins have quite interesting abilities. The Calidus Assassin has a Polymorphine ability, of course, that makes enemies not shoot her. She also has Assassin's Touch, which reduces the unit's health, speed, and morale, which is best used on commanders, of course. The Avisal Assassins are as mad as you think they are. Kill the target and nothing else. They have Melter Bombs for vehicles, and Combat Jogs as an ability which makes you lose control of them, but doubles their speed and damage. The Collectus Assassin being my favourite, since they're Psyker Hunters, have a Psych Out Grenade, basically making a Psyker incapacitated, but are useless against non-Psyker targets. Their other ability blasts negative psychic energy that removes Psyker's powers and lowers their maximum health. For vehicles, you get an Exorcist Sanctorum, which is basically a whirlwind, and an Incarcerator, which is a glass cannon, literally. Shoots beams with demonic energy that does a lot of damage. Last, we have the Throne of Judgment with a Lord Inquisitor. This is one of those weird war machines that you never see in 40k, but it's still part of it. It's better used to support units and tank than deal damage. Has an ability that prevents it taking damage, and also one that buffs nearby troops. On to the Demon Hunters. The Ordo Malleus. We're getting close to the end, lads. The Demon Hunters bring the full might of the Grey Knights and the Inquisition. Of course, in vanilla, the Grey Knights were a single unit, but now you have the choice to bring the full might of them. You can go up against any race or faction and do well, but of course, a lot of their abilities will really be focusing around fighting demons, and some only work on demons. Let me give you an example. The Grey Knight Librarian has access to the tombs of the Ordo Malleus. You can only pick one of these books, but each one gives him abilities. They can very easily be categorised to protecting troops from abilities and spells, buffing the Librarian with damaging and protective abilities, damaging the morale and abilities of enemies, but the last one is Liber Demonchia. If anyone knows their lore, this is the Grey Knight's How to Kill Demons for Dummies. These three spells can only target demons. You have the Dark Commandant that allows you to take control of a demon, but it's very unpredictable since some demons can resist. Instability, where the target's health and morale degrades at a high rate, and lastly, Imprisonment, which traps a greater demon. As you can imagine, the amount of willpower to do this would be nuts, so the Librarian can't move or interact when performing this. I would love to show this to you, but as you can imagine, recording this is easier said than done. The Demon Hunters have two ways you can play them. From the start, you will either need to pick the Inquisition or the army that doesn't need painting. The Grey Knights, I would say, are the easier of the two, just because you have more powerful units at the start. Grey Knight Inceptors and Purifiers will carry you till you get the later stuff out. You can get Grey Knight Apothecaries, Grey Knight Tech Marines, Grey Knight Terminators, Grey Knight Dreadnoughts, Grey Knight Grey Knights. I still remember the memes around this when it came out. One mechanic I do like of the Witch Hunters is you can build Purification Decrees. It's essentially a nice safe space for you. Or a tower with a big middle finger to anyone who tries to attack you that slows them down and if upgraded damages them. One of the really powerful units you can get is the Grey Knight Paladins. These Paladins will shoot kids, they're not like normal Paladins. They get all their upgrades and a Holocaust ability. What this will do is it will put the enemies in camps. It's a joke, it's a joke, relax. Actually, why do I care? Most people here probably say worse shit in real life. The Holocaust would damage enemies in a large area. 
time for the Inquisition, and they do what they do best, calling the Exterminators on their enemies and their allies. You get Stormtroopers and Scholars for the early game units, but you really want to get an Inquisitor out as quickly as possible. He can call down Lance Strikes and a baby Exterminatus. You can also get an Assassin and an Acolyte. Why do they look like a KK? Do you know what? Never mind. If you want to live out your Eisenhorn dream, turn on the Demon Host settings. Who gives a shit about heresy? Kill the Acolyte and summon a Demon Host. And they are very powerful and extremely fun to use against your enemies. Remember when I said who gives a shit about heresy? Well, an Inquisitor from the Audio Hereticus becomes available. If you don't get her, then the Grey Knights you have access to just say, nah, fuck this, you're on your own. Quite a cool mechanic. You can also get Bodyguards for the Inquisitor, a Chimera APC. For the late game, you can get a Land Raider Phobos, Crusader and Redeemer. On to the last race, which is the Tyranids. The final race, the Tyranids. Playing as the Hive is definitely not easy. They have quite a few different mechanics that you need to take note of. First of all, you have no builders. You have this second HUD that you need to use by clicking on the brain to access. This allows you to call down different buildings, but the way you play the Tyranids is getting out units is cheap, but upgrading them and getting new buildings out takes a long time and is very expensive. You have this mechanic influence in the top left corner, which goes up by having resource posts captured. You will use this to make buildings and upgrades. Another mechanic is the Synapse. Of course, in tabletop, if Tyranids don't remain near a Synapse creature, they will just attack the nearest thing. So in game, their morale will never go down if in range of a Synapse creature, but if they aren't, they will take morale loss very quick. I know this might be something that could be done in the future, and I'm sure that modders already know this and will do it, but I would love to see like other races if you could choose a Hive Fleet to specialise in. Like, if you pick Kraken or Behemoth, you would be much better in combat and rushing the enemy, or Cronus would focus on better range damage. Jormungandr could allow units to burrow anywhere on the map, etc. As I said, I'm sure this stuff isn't like a priority, of course, but it would still be cool to see in the future at some point. Since I collect Tyranids, it's nice seeing all the little details on certain units and upgrades. Like Adrenal Glands, Extended Carapace, Scything Talons, it's all there. Once you control a lot of the map, you can get out a Capillary Tower for world consumption. This increases the Synapse range over a giant area, allowing for the Tyranids to not be near commanders or buildings. For the army, you have most of the Tyranid roster, Termagants, Hormigants, Gene Sealers, Warriors, Lictors, Zonothropes, Biovores. For Synapse or Leaders, you can get Broodlords, Hive Tyrants with their upgrades, and Old One-Eye. I love the lore around One-Eye. I still like the idea that the Hive recreates this Carnifex to create fear. You don't have the Hierophant like Apocalypse, but you get the Trigon. Hopefully we'll see more Tyranid units at a later date. But once again, I think they're being coded currently to work in campaign. I did it! I got through all the races. I mentioned a little bit of this early in the video, but you have many different settings. Survival mode and last stand work automatically by picking the map, so you don't need to worry about changing anything. Just follow the instructions in the top right. You can customise a match to play how you want. Restrict units, have titan battles, booby traps around the map. There's also easter eggs here, and I'm sure I've not found them all. If you want to see the description of each setting, they're in the bottom left corner. I better show you how to install this mod, otherwise I'm sure someone will complain in the comments. Number 1. Download the Dawn of War mod manager. Number 2. Locate your Soulstorm file location. To find Soulstorm in your library, just look above where you've uninstalled Dawn of War 3 and Eternal Crusade. Right click on the game and go to properties, then find local files, and then click browse. Open the file you just downloaded and then simply move the Dawn of War mod manager into Soulstorm. From there, simply create a shortcut to your desktop. The reason I've got two here is because I have an updated version. Number three, download the mod installer, the core files and the race mod. Links to all the downloads will be in the description. Make sure you download and keep these in the same folder when installing, otherwise it won't work. For most of you, this will be located in your downloads folder. Run the installer and press agree. Then find your Soulstorm folder, usually it does this automatically and press next. If you have not installed the Dawn of War mod manager, you can obviously install it here as well, but of course you want to install the Tyranid mod as well if you want to play with Tyranids, and then click install. It's important to note that this is using an updated Tyranid mod, so using one that you might have installed with Apocalypse may not work. After that, run the Dawn of War mod manager and make sure you toggle LAA on. After that, you should be able to start the mod and be good to go, but however, I will say you might run into some problems. If you do run into problems, I recommend you join the Unification Mod Discord. Team Thubmizer have already compiled a massive list of questions and answers for any problems that may occur. 
For me personally, I started to have FPS flickers, but when I read the instructions on their Discord, it was a very easy fix. Each mod on the website has instructions on how to install it as well as the Discord, and if you still run into problems, you can always go to the tech support section of the Discord. There are also other ways you can install the mod, for example if you're on Mac, or if you want to install the mod manually. The last thing to install which I have covered today in the video is the campaign configurator. Simply download the unification configurator and then drop the file into the unification bug fix in the Dawn of War Soulstorm folder. Create a shortcut to your desktop and then you can easily edit the campaign before you load up the game. Once again there are always updates and patches coming out for this mod and you may run into other problems that I haven't experienced so I always recommend if you do have problems join the discord. I imagine the modders will be adding, changing and balancing this mod for years to come and for the amount of work they've put in so far I can't wait for what comes next. In fact they've already teased it. For all you Papa Nurgle lovers, Death Guard are on their way. Maybe I'll do a follow up video in a few years time to see how far the mod has come. I can already see someone saying, well that didn't age well did it? For anyone who wants some regular unification mod content, I recommend you go check out Dawn of War Cinematic Battle. Special thanks to you mate. Also because I'm such a nice guy, Space Battle 2020 and Iron Gaming 40k. Both also do unification mod content. Last thing I want to do is thank the modders. Kekulis, sorry if I butchered your name, but thanks for giving me insight into this mod. And once again, be proud of what you and your team have made here. I hope this video gives some justification to the amount of work you guys have done, but I don't think it has since I know there's many things I've still left uncovered. For those wanting to know what my next video is, I've got many plans for videos. Not early access or speculation anymore, videos that I'm going to be putting